Orville Orville, the podcast that reviews every single episode of the Orville. I'm Michael, and I'm joined by G.I. Jolie. Hi! <laughs> also joined by Champion. Yes, also joined by Champion. <laughs> oh, is there an echo Back in here? Back again. This is great. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Awesome, awesome. Pretty good, pretty good. So yeah, you know what's funny is before we started recording, we... Um, we had a discussion about cheap fan service and member berries and Easter eggs and all that stuff. And one thing, I know this is about the Orville, but one thing I want to say about Star Trek The Next Generation is that the producers of the show, I don't know if you guys know this, they actually had an, a rule. Like, I don't know if it was an unwritten rule or a written rule that they would not have, was it, I think it might have been any appearances by Vulcans or something like that where they actually went out of their way to, to like, no, 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 we're going to create new races. We're not going to have Vulcans. We're not going to have Spock. We're not going to have... Basically, before the, the word, the term member berries existed, they decided they weren't going to have member berries. Now, if you're watching TNG and you know it's Star Trek, but they didn't have the cheap throwbacks that all current, you know, franchise media has. And that's another reason why the show was so great, because it stands on its own. And the fact that the Orville is not a pastiche of Star Trek, the original series, it's specifically a pastiche of the next generation, I think says a lot about how much that show can stand on its own. And, and it, you know, it, it's its own thing and it's got its own fan base. I think that's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Although the, the TNG thing, that only lasted for the, for the, for the first season. Really. I mean, like I, that, that was their, that was their goal to begin with. And that's why we got the Ferengi and so on and so forth. They were supposed to be the new Star Trek villain, but they kind of dropped the ball with some of those aliens. So they had to go back to the well. With Vol did they eventually, I don't remember how far, it, how long it was till they had Vulcans. I know that Spock guest appeared in season six or seven. Yes. Yeah, so we had some, uh, we had some Vulcan storylines. There was, um, it's been a while since I watched a lot of uh, TNG, but uh, there was a, a two-parter episode called Reunification, I believe. Oh, it yes. Was about, uh, oh, yeah, that was later, though. That was like six, that, that was so quite a bit later. About. Yeah. But we, but we did see Romulans at the very end of the yes. first season. When okay. I, I think it became clear that the Ferengi weren't really taken seriously as a villain. That's true. So they, they needed to bring something back, and that's where we, got, uh, where we got the Romulans back again. But then the Borg, I think that was season two. Yeah, we were introduced to them. So, well, they were kind of the re the, the replacement for the Ferengi because the Ferengi failed so miserably. Mm -hmm. But I do must I have to point out again that in seven seasons of TNG, we got one cameo by Bones, one episode, one a two parter with Spock, one episode with Scotty, right? Mm -hmm. And that was it. We got and some I, uh, some episodes of Sarek as well. I think we got more Sarek. Yeah, than we that's did Spock. true. Okay, that's true. But with Every post-2005 Star Trek, we've got a different actor playing Spock. Now another actor playing Spock. Uh, we have a long-lost brother of Spock, a long-lost sister of Spock. Um, Spock, Leonard Nimoy in the movies. Mm -hmm. um, three of them, I think. I don't know. I'm just pointing out the difference. I don't know. It's a little annoying. You know, <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, it wouldn't surprise me if the entire point of the uh, no, you know, no Ferengi, or sorry, no, uh, no Vulcans, no Klingons, initially for the next generation, if that was only to keep Will Shatner away. Yeah. <laughs> I want a, so I want an episode about me. No, Will, sorry, we, we can't sorry, do it. We have this policy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I want to drive the ship. It is funny that he wasn't in the J.J. Abrams reboot, but whatever. That's a story for another time. <laughs> we are here to talk about the Orville. Uh, we're talking about All the World is Birthday Cake. And Champion Ooh. is... What is your nickname? Is it Mr. Memory? No, it's Memory Master. The Memory Master. Memory Master. It's hilarious because my memory is actually pretty terrible. Oh, well, it's better than <laughs> mine. But anyway, so you're going to tell us what this episode is about. I'm gonna and do my best. This is uh, all the world. It's birthday cake. It starts off with a cold open on another planet that we have no idea where it is or who these people are, but they're discussing some sort of technology and some sort of signal that they want to send. And we get the impression that they are taking their first steps into exploring the universe around them. 
they send this signal that turns out to be, it's very simple. It's like, is anybody out there? Now we cut to the Orville where we are meeting our new chief of security, who is another Salayan named Tala. And uh, after this introduction, the uh, Orville picks up this signal from this planet. And, oh, wow, this is really interesting. This is what this exploratory vessel is out here to do. So they excitedly go to visit this planet and they land and they meet a, a very hospitable um, race of people, welcome the, the crew of the Orville with open arms. They um, have a, a very fancy state dinner where they, uh, they, they toast and they, they say some things about you know, how great it is to be exploring the universe. But then it, uh, it becomes apparent that Oh, sorry. Then uh, we, we learn that it's, it's Kelly's and Bordas's birthday. And they mention that at the dinner table and everyone there freaks out. And they mm -hmm. take Kelly and Bordas and they place them under arrest. Nobody knows what the hell's going on. <laughs> now, it happens that this race of people is governed completely by astrology. And... <laughs> Kelly and Bordas were born under a bad sign, as mm -hmm. it were, and they are Jiliac, which on this planet, if you're born under the sign of Jiliac, you are um, you're a subclass. You are a, a predisposed to violence, and you're rounded up and you're thrown into a camp. So Kelly and Bordas get rounded up and thrown into a camp. The rest of the Orville's crew are asked to leave because they. Uh, they hang around with Jiliacs, and if you're hanging out with the Jiliac, we don't want to know you. <clears throat> the Admiralty decides that they can't rescue them because that would be uh, it would go against first contact sort of um, regulations. So they have to find a way to trick them into giving their people back. So uh, the new security chief Tala asks them to scan the uh, the constellation. The, uh, mm -hmm. the Jiliac constellation, where they find that there's a black hole that's existed there for about 3,000 years, which is right around the time when this people was forming their mythology. And they determine that that's probably the reason why the Jiliac is uh, an unfavorable sign. So they go about restoring the star. Of course, they can't restore a star, but they do put a giant mirror up in space that reflects light back, and uh, the planet sees this star, and... They uh, decide that the Jiliac aren't bad people anymore. They let Kelly and Bordas mm -hmm. go, and uh, that's that's everyone's happy, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> so, again, we have another odd episode. Um, I, I I like the idea of a, of a of a society being obsessed with the the. Um, Zodiac, because I, I have a personal vendetta against people that believe in the Zodiac, only because, well, I don't want to get into a religious discussion, but I don't know. I find belief in the Zodiac even more irritating than organized religion, but whatever. So I'm glad that, you know, Seth MacFarlane has chosen this target. Um, however, I do think that what ruins this episode is how quickly this culture turns on them. It would have been so much better if it was more subtle. Like when Kelly and Bordas talk about their birthday, if they casually were kind of like, oh, really? And then they were maybe quietly, you know, kidnapped in the middle of the night. But the fact that they practically flipped the table, kidnapped them, and kidnapped them and start threatening everyone's life, it just felt so forced. Like, I know that not every culture is the same, but the fact that they were at that point in their technology means I think that they would be a little bit more, a little bit less barbaric in their response to, you know, the, the fact that they're born under a bad sign, as you said. So I think that's one thing that hurt it. Um, another thing is when we see uh, Bordas and Kelly captured in this kind of concentration camp, it was pretty, you know, a, a frightening experience to see them go through, but it felt like the tone didn't quite match. I don't know, the rest of the episode or the rest of the Orville or something, I don't know. Something didn't feel, quite feel on or didn't click with me, but that's my take on it. Uh, what did you guys think? Yeah, so you don't really get to see a lot of the camp. I think maybe that's why. 
the gravity of their situation isn't really it, like it, it isn't really present in the tone uh, mm-hmm. when you see Kelly and Bordis inside the Gilead camp. Um, I I look at, but let's go back to uh, where your problems with the episode start. So like yours was with their dinner, how they become their. I I I don't totally agree. Um, like they don't have to drag them away in the middle of the night. It's not so far off to believe that a colon um a a race of people can be so fanatical right about their beliefs that they would drag you away immediately i mean some of them currently exist on this very earth that we live on so um i i buy i buy that there could be that type of big reaction however they just made first contact with people from outer space yeah Part of me is skeptical about um, their react. Like again, the, part of my skepticism is in the reaction. I feel like no matter how fanatical you could be, you would you wouldn't just be like, "Oh, I'm sorry, what? Mm-hmm. You're both born under the sign of Giliac here on our Earth, or on our planet, Rhaegar three, two, three, whatever, two. Yeah. Ragnarok." Um, so people who are born in this month are considered this because you come from other planets whose astrological signs are probably totally different. (laughs) Then, um, you guys should probably go. (laughs) It wouldn't be cool if the people of our planet found out that you were here because this is what we do to those people. We... Mm -hmm jail them and they're for for thousands of years now we've been jailing them and they've been okay with that um i feel like they're for a species that is advanced enough what to advanced enough to be able to send messages out into space but to also have sort of fanatical beliefs i don't feel like that they i don't feel like they would have not been uh open to explanations well reasoning uh, uh, yeah, I know. And the thing is, is the be- their fanatical belief directly conflicts with the plot of the episode, which is that they've just met people from outer space for the first time. It's almost yeah. like they should have substituted their fanatical belief for a different one because yeah. you know what I mean? Because the the very existence of these aliens on this spaceship if anything, they would say, well, you guys have been in space. Tell us, are the, do these, it'd be like if you had a, um, like a religious fanatic uh, on earth that was a Christian and someone flew in from heaven. You'd be like, oh, tell us about heaven. You know what I mean? Like, the, why didn't they say that? Why didn't they say, well, we have this belief system. Tell us about it. They could have said, no, yeah. no, no, we've been there. What you believe about these astrological signs is inaccurate because we've literally flown our ship through them they're meaningless these stars are <laughs> millions of light years apart they're different distances from your planet blah 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 but anyway that's my take on it everything everything about this episode bugged me <laughs> okay <laughs> everything and i mean like okay i can i can buy the fanaticism mm-hmm. but if i like the, the the fanaticism is is far fetched, but I can buy it. I can wrap my head around it. But by wrapping my head around it, I now I can't wrap my head around any of the denouement at all. Because if they're that fanatical to jail people from space that they just met over their birthday, they're too fanatical to let them go because a star appears. Right, like yeah, they're, that's they're, a good they're point. not going to do that, <clears throat> especially not right away. And that's that's ignoring the fact that it took one of the Jiliac who was just there to watch the execution to point up in the sky and say, "Look, that look. was bad." And then everyone's like, "Oh, what does it mean? It means change." Now, <laughs> yeah, the the fact that they were, my God, everything bugged me. The star <laughs> itself. They, they put this mirror up into space, but they, they throw it up in a low orbit. <sighs> okay, that's fine. 
as long as you're looking at it from the exact right angle, if you're rep rep replicating a star in the middle of a constellation, you got to have that far enough away so the geometry isn't going to screw with you if you happen to look at the thing from 20 kilometers in this direction. Right. Because now it's going to look off. Okay, that bugged me about it too. What else bugged me? Um, the fact that the show, this particular episode, wasn't really about anything. It was like, oh, astrology's bad. Okay, fine. You don't really have much of a message there. So cool it with some of the concentration camp imagery. Like get yeah. that get that star off of the off of their shoulder. Like Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, mm -hmm. this is a little heavy handed and a right. little I don't know, borderline insulting and offensive. I think right, like because you're not you don't have a message. Mm -hmm. This this isn't an important thing that you're saying. Astrology is bad. I get it. You don't have to evoke the imagery of a concentration camp right. to get that point across. Um, the scenes with the baby in the concentration camp. And the yeah. mother is like, oh, so what's up? Well, we, tr we tried to time it out just right, but we didn't. What were you we trying to do? Well, we were trying to make sure that our baby was a Jiliac. Well, we have to hide it now because it's whatever uh, the, the, the star sign that means that it's going to grow up to be a productive member of society. We have to keep the baby a secret now because it was a Wak Wakanda or something like that. It's, it's this, Wakanda, yeah. <laughs> because this, this, this baby was meant to lead, not rot away in the camps. Well, we have mm -hmm. to hide it. Why? So it rots away in the camps? Like this, this is, <laughs> you, you literally just said that, that your child's going to rot away in the camps now. And now you're actively trying to hide it. So it doesn't have a better life. And uh, we're, we're taking your kid away to take it to a place where it's not going to die a horrible death. Oh no. Like mother of the year. Come on. This is just, uh, everything bugged me. What else bugged yeah. me? That might be it. Cause there wasn't an awful lot going on in this episode, but no, yeah. Well, Nothing. oh, and, and the fact that that Tala, your new chief of security, just happens to have this idea. Why don't you scan for a black hole? Why? Yeah, Why I would know, anyone I have know. that idea? I know. And now that you've found it, you you put two and two and two together. Well, the black hole is only 3000 years old. This must be the reason for their entire religion. I know. Oh, I know. Okay, you put you put a lot of thought into that. And then they just put a, a new star up there to reinforce this religion of theirs you're right like is, i know isn't that, isn't that a crazy uh, it doesn't solve you're, anything you're really manipulating their culture now when the entire point of you not going down to get your crew in the first place was to not manipulate their culture at all but you it, in, in you order to get changed. around that you do it on a far grander scale oh yeah and they address it too not only that but they're like you know, we're not supposed to mess with them. We're not supposed to mess with new cultures on first contact. But yeah, forget about it. We're just going to do it. <laughs> so well, let's change the course of their entire religion. Yeah. By, all, by putting a sign up for them that reinforces everything. And yeah. You know, uh, also, I, it was it was like the, the writing of the show is mostly good overall. It was really bad when a pinpoint of light appeared in the sky and someone noticed it in one millisecond oh look oh my god look up in the sky <laughs> that was terrible writing and then they show us and like i can't even tell right exactly like, as I'm, I'm the viewer you got to explain this to me i'm the one right. that's watching can can you at, at least and there was some things about this episode that i like like the acting was great yeah right? and and the set pieces were fine i i thought that the camp actually like it didn't feel Orville-y, but that's okay because yeah, you're on a different fine. planet. You're on yeah. a different planet. And that's the thing is it was good on its own. And like the guy who was running the concentration camp was frightening. And I like the conflict where uh, the, the one guy was trying to steal, I think it was the food from the girl. Mm -hmm. And then yep. Bordas stepped in and, and then like it kind of intimidated him. And he was like, he, he will not return. He's a coward. Like all that felt very realistic and very scary. So I liked it. It's just that it felt like, I think it's like you said about the whole um, Holocaust analogy with like whatever. It, it, it feels like the episode didn't earn it because it was, it, it didn't fully flesh out its ideas well enough. Mm -hmm. And I yep. think that that's kind of, if there is a weakness to the show, that might be it, right? Overall is that there are a lot of really good ideas and they're hitting the right, like they're going after the right targets, but they're not fleshing them out well enough. Yeah, we, we're not we're not made to care enough, right? To right. to to invoke Holocaust imagery, like no, no, right. you gotta if you're gonna do that, you gotta 
you gotta do it right. Right. Yeah, you gotta come to us with way better writing than, hey guys, can you scan the Juliet constellation? I have a hunch. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Crap. And also, I don't think, I mean, obviously it's only her first episode, but I don't think we've, I mean, even over the course of the next few episodes, they don't really have a character for, uh, what's her name again? Tala. Tala. Yeah, and it's like, so what is she is, and again, it's like the fact that she's the one that figures this out, obviously they want to give a new character something to do, but... I just wonder why it was her and what's her thing, but whatever. I mean, no, it, was, it was her because she's new. I, it, it bugs me too. Another thing that bugs me with this episode is that they got another Zalan for chief of security. After like, didn't we? Didn't we learn that? <laughs> right. Good point. That, that, that there are very, very few Zalans in the military, uh-huh. and they just happen to find another one who just happened to be in security and just happened to be the exact person to fill the job posting that they're looking for. Good point. Yeah. Good point. And there just like, happens, <clears throat> she just happens to come from a family who are like specifically military slans too. Mm-hmm. Is that it's a established too in this episode? Ep- yeah. I, I, I don't remember if that was established in this episode though. Oh, okay. But I could but be What definitely be what definitely was established in this episode was that there are some birthdays this month. <laughs> oh, Do you just, okay. let's just go straight for the jokes we can talk about uh, Tala's character in like a later episode I think when we figure out a little bit more about her okay so again I've been recording these jokes directly off the TV so pardon me if they're a little rough but I'll do my best here okay let's see <laughs> what we got Orville I think it's 17 all the world is birthday cake my birthday it's next week Where is this too we are having separate celebrations. <laughs> so, so that that that's when they're sitting at dinner and they had been arguing for the whole episode about sharing a birthday. And I just thought it was funny that he threw that in again to the uh, to the aliens that he wanted to make sure they knew <laughs> that they were oh, having yes, that, separate celebrations. So that, that was at the fancy state dinner. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So they'd already been <laughs> arguing about it at the beginning of the episode, but yeah, he just wanted to make that clear to these aliens. It's <laughs> such a good, th- and okay, we've been talking this whole episode of, of Morville about how the writing hasn't been like great for the episode, but the writing of that joke, let me tell you, it's a three-parter. Yeah. Exactly. Cause at, okay. Yeah. Because, Ed convinces Kelly to go and ask. Like they, they kind of go back and forth. Just ask him. He's right there. No, I don't want to ask him. Just ask him. You're like, what are they talking about? And Kelly walks up to Bordis on the the bridge and is like, so my birthday's next week, and I heard your birthday is next week, and we thought it'd be fun to like have a joint birthday party. He's like, is that a? Does that mean that we have to have the same party? And she's like, well, yeah, that's what a joint birthday party is. And he's like, no. Yeah, <laughs> I would like. No, I'm fine like, with is a that separate a celebration. Yeah. Right? <laughs> he's like, no, I'm, I'm good. I would like. It's my. He he says, no, it's my day. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> like, now you want to know something, wow. guys? I hate to say it. That's actually the only joke that I recorded for this one. So, well, make- it's uh, it's not the part of the episode that made me laugh the hardest, and uh, that is, it's another, it's another Mocklin joke, although it wasn't Bordis. <laughs> this was uh, at the very end of the episode when they're having the party on the bridge, and I forget if it was if it was uh, Malloy or I forget who it was, but they made a, a little flash video and they put it on the oh, view screen of yes. Kelly and Bordis dancing. Yes, and yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> I, I don't know why it just hit me right in the in the in the funny bone. Clyden laughing, and then Bordis like, "What? What are you laughing at?" It is amusing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on the floor. I, yeah. I don't, just, just his delivery yeah. was perfect. <laughs> and it's, it's, it, it's I, I love the fact that all Mocklins seem to have this stoicism, but they also have the perfect comedic delivery. Yes. I, it's just <laughs> this race of people that's very serious, but actually hilarious once you listen to them talk <laughs> and it's funny because like we said i kind of wish wharf was more like this like there's only a few times where they really like obviously there was a running gag of how much of a 
um, how miserable he was. But like, I remember the one episode where Worf, what was it? They started playing some Klingon music and he started singing like along to the Klingon opera. Yeah. And it was mm-hmm. so over the top. But I remember thinking <laughs> they should do this more often with Worf, but they didn't, you know? I don't and know. When you, I agree 100%. And when you look at pretty much every other Klingon on that show, Worf is the only one who broods all the time. The right. rest of them get drunk and they joke around and they have a great time. Imagine Worf as a bit of a practical joker, right? Imagine him as someone who knew how to have a good time sure. and just want to beat people up. Yeah. It could have, it could have given him a, a whole whole other dimension. Yeah. Well, that's a... Yeah, that's... Uh, ugh. It's a discussion for another time, but as much as I love TNG, I feel like at least half of the characters on the cast were not fully developed or not properly developed, you know? But then again, that applies to the original series too, where really only Kirk, Spock, and Bones were fully fleshed out, I felt like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a discussion for another time. So I don't know. Overall, I guess it's kind of another miss with this episode, eh? Uh, Big miss for me. This one bugged me. Yeah. I mean, I was still entertained by a lot of it, but yeah, I really felt like they missed the mark in a lot of things. Yeah, Uh. something interesting really happened in this episode. And then it was just quickly, any excitement that you could have had for it was quickly erased. Yeah. I agree. Uh, By just like some heavy handed... Uh, heavy-handed attempts at trying to discredit astrology by Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Heavy-handed. Well, I guess that's it. I guess that wraps up a review of All the World is Birthday Cake. Uh, you can find every episode of Morville Orville at www.comicbooksyndicate.com. Uh, we're reviewing every episode of the series uh, until we catch up to Season 3, which is premiering in June, I believe. So we're all excited about that. Uh, I want to thank G.I. Jolie and Champion for joining me again. It's always thank fun. You. You're welcome. Woo! Okay, so until next time, there's more where that came from.